Listen. If the grass goes past your ankles, don't go in. We were getting a lot of horror requests throughout October, and if it wasn't for the bogus copyright claims that take like 30 days, my dude, that I, I, we would have been able to have all of these other videos we wanted to get out. But nonetheless, hopefully this video is available for you and doesn't get shoved like one of the movies we're about to break down, which got delayed for two years. Let me explain. So this is an adaptation written by the father-son duo of Stephen King and Joe Hill. It's directed by Vincenzo Natali, who's the dirty boy who did that movie Splice. But he also did the movie Cube, which if you never saw, is the story of a bunch of people trapped in a cube who just end up entering other cubed rooms and so on as they try to escape. So perfect guy to direct the movie about people lost in grass. He got the book option for a buck, which is really interesting since King does this dollar babies initiative. The only thing was he had to rush the script in three weeks. And if I'm being honest, I think he does a great job in every other department. His actors are pretty good, with Patrick Wilson killing it as a creepo. The sound design through my Dolby Atmos surround sound was impeccable. I thought it was in there with them. It looked beautiful. And even in the commentary for the film, they called it a Terrence Malick horror movie, which I agree. Especially when nothing happens. But Netflix was lying when they said that this was in 4K and how crisp that contrast would be. And if you're watching this on a TV that can support the Battle of Winterfell, you're gonna enjoy looking at this. That said, the story is stupid as hell. After seeing grass for like 90 minutes, it just leaves you with the question, does, does everything need to be a whole feature film? I've mentioned multiple times that I truly believe some stories work better in a certain medium, as a novel, a comic, a cartoon. Not everything needs to be a full length movie, especially when the original was a novella. Like, Y'all should've just kept this as a short. The entire thing ends up being a time loop orchestrated by this ancient evil entity, let's call it, who attracts people to enter this inescapable but escapable tall grass near a church in the middle of nowhere. It has some rules, like the dead not moving while you're in there, but um, for the most part, anything really is possible since the graph is shifting more than the logic in the script. We begin by following Becky and Cal, who are brother and sister, traveling to San Diego where Becky's giving the baby up for adoption at six months. They get duped by a kid named Tobin, whose family got stuck in the grass after them because they were chasing their dog and they've lost their minds in there even though they got there after them, uh, but they were there before them. You know, Becky's baby daddy Travis, who dipped faster than the Rotten Tomato score for this movie, hears that they've been missing for two whole weeks, but he doesn't go searching for them till it's been two whole months. And for the first 40-ish minutes, I did find it interesting. And the character of Ross, yeah, that dude was creepy as hell. Uh, Ross Humboldt's the name. Real estate's the game. Boy, I guess I should be used to Patrick Wilson losing his kid in horror movies, but uh, look, I've never seen him feed a woman her own stillborn. That's a whole other level. There's also a rock that's introduced as this powerful force within the grass that seems to give knowledge like the tree of good and evil in Genesis. It kind of tests morality like the detector in the good place. And while I felt the rules to me kind of contradicted themselves for it, I didn't mind it being ambiguous and open to interpretation. I can see why people view it as a story about purgatory where a Christian family man goes and insane while a prodigal son finds a way for his son. Since way back with Cube, the director's been talking about wanting to make a movie where it all completely takes place in hell. And maybe this is part of it. Like I said, the whole thing is a time loop and more specifically a time paradox as it's called. And I'll give the director this. He specifically stated that it's magic and not science in the commentary that he did, which means that that's what's driving all the rules of this world. And he does make sure that every single character ends up in a paradoxal loop, meaning that there really is no beginning or end and they were there before and after everybody else. That said, they're also dying multiple times, so it's not even really a loop, but like, balls of yarn. That doesn't make any sense. Name one thing in here that does. See, I don't mind movies with paradoxes. I just prefer the ending to the original, not this altered timeline that allows people who are already dead to escape. That's not being a paradox, or even alternate timelines, but just random duplicates who appear to die and I guess will continue to? <laughs> What the fuck you doing in my corn? Now in the short story, the characters were actually younger and the teens were driving away to stay with their aunt during Becky's pregnancy. The ending is way grimmer in the book and it has this never ending doom, yet in the movie, there's incest, something that's never fully addressed. And then that dude rides off into the sunset with his sister, so I don't know about that. Overall, I'd say if you want a better Fields movie from King, or a movie dealing with Fields, go for this one right here. If you want a better thriller from the director, then maybe Cube.
Another horror out right now is Polaroid, which was supposed to come out in 2017 before being delayed more times than New Mutants. Sadly, there's a lot of movies out there that have been shelved during the Weinstein fallout that were just in the mix and sadly haven't been able to get the distribution that they were supposed to get. Either they've been altered, either they've just been shelved completely, and it sucks because recently I was able to catch the director's cut to the current war, which, yo, I, I really like that movie. So it just sucks knowing that some good movies have been lost in the mix. Polaroid, it's a decent rent it. Stream it on Hoopla if you got a library card. Some of you may hear the plot to this, uh, this plot dealing with a killer camera and just remember Say Cheese and Die, the Ryan Gosling Goosebumps episode, which, you know, sadly he didn't reprise his role for the sequel, Say Cheese and Die, again. But I remember seeing the trailer for this, it seems like decades ago, and liking the concept of a Polaroid camera that kills anyone who's photographed with its only weakness being heat and light because maybe this thing behaves just like a photograph does. We follow a girl named Bird who gets the Polaroid camera as a gift, and at first, poor Bird's out there almost killing fathers, daughters, and dogs unknowingly, but she quickly notices a smudge on each Polaroid that ends up coming to life and killing her friends. So, you know, it's just a matter of time till we get that movie about the killer selfie app. As you know, what usually makes or breaks these teen horrors is the group of friends, the cast of players, we as the audience follow along and try to guess who survives till the end, and here, they're alright. They're not terrible like they've been in others, but it's also nothing too engaging, they, they just get the job done. Not too dumb, but definitely not geniuses. Let's go. Doofus, like, y'all already confirmed this camera's a loaded weapon, and y'all playing with it like I'll bop it? And he slaps a cow, leaving him to die in a cell. You goof. As they start dying one by one, Bird decides to investigate the initials RJS that are on the camera, and they find out that it belonged to a photographer, Roland Joseph Sable, who had this messed up Freddy Krueger type backstory where he captured and tortured four high school students, killed three of them before the one that got away got him shot up by the cops. So now that she knows that, the ghost throws two stones for one bird. I love how she's keeping up with the rules of the game, having not been in any photograph, like she's for sure about that, until under further review, you see her in the reflection of a picture, like this ghost really is pulling a CSI enhance on her ass. His glasses. There's a reflection. They visit Sable's wife and find out that the camera actually belonged to his daughter. And I'll say, the, the way they reveal things is pretty interesting. Because it was actually the daughter who was harassed by four high schoolers, which in turn caused her to take her own life. Turns out the dad's more Friday the 13th than Elm Street because he was seeking revenge for his daughter and killed three of the bullies before the fourth escaped, causing Roland to still haunt him in the afterlife because he died... I guess he died with his camera, so he's just, you know how it goes. But then, there's a last minute twist. It's then revealed that all of that is a lie, and it's actually the dad who was taking pictures of the daughter, and who knows what else. The four teens were actually her friends who wanted to go to the police before the dad found out, tortured and killed the three to keep them quiet before the fourth got away. The fourth being the cop who got slapped. They pulled off the reviews you know i usually hate when they show you a flashback on screen only for it to just be a complete lie like why would you show me something and then it not be real uh but here the twist it's pretty subtle because when you rewatch the scene where the mom's describing everything all the footage it, it, it was there like if you really pay attention she's just as disgusting as the dead the main thing i usually have an issue with in movies like this is uh, the murderer's objective uh, when he becomes a demon like you made it to the afterlife through this camera because you got one more person on your list, but how is killing every kid who grabs the camera gonna get you to your goal? I mean, I guess in a series of random events you were able to get a slap out of it, but really if these kids weren't idiotically smart enough to survive, then he would have never gotten his revenge. I never get why they make the ghost so dumb, like just for jump scares for us. They're always sneaking up on people from angles only the cameraman can see, but then disappear? Like, what are the ghosts doing? Are, are they trying to scare the viewer who doesn't exist within the world of the movie? I'm just saying, if you've entered the afterlife, then you should have a one-up in various ways. By the end of it, Bird shoots her shot, taking a picture of the entity itself, crushing her own hand in the process. She burns the demon, tosses the camera without cops suspecting why one of theirs just got split in half, and they get to live happily ever after, ignoring the fact that they just got a lot of innocent people killed.
Wait, is this a short story? All right, new ending. Keep your horror short and sweet. Thank you guys for checking out this video, and I'm curious to know your thoughts about it down below for any of these two movies. But more so, what are the spooky movies you're watching right now? Uh, these were some of the most requested that we got, but uh, one of the other ones that I did catch out recently uh, is One Cut of the Dead. That movie's pretty good. Like, it starts out, I, I, won't, I don't want to spoil much of it. Go into it blank if you can. Um, I really like that movie. I think it's on Shudder, so definitely go check it out over there if you can. Marianne is another one that's on Netflix, but that's a show. I'm halfway through that. Uh, it's going to be very difficult getting that one out because the copyright and shows just it, there's so much footage to collect to begin with so those take a little bit of time and then to get a copyright and then the video can't be like all that work going for nothing you know uh, that sucks but i would recommend both of those one cut of the dead and marianne but i'm curious to know your thoughts on both of these as well uh i know a lot of people aren't liking in the tall grass but i thought it looked great i agree the story isn't really there i don't get why the incest kid survived but read the novella online if you can uh it's considered uh, fiction for men uh so if you're a woman I i'm sorry uh maybe write to esquire see if they let you read it but other than that i, I do think it's interesting how he's written i think most of his scripts and I think he does a really good job visually, the director for In the Tall Grass. I just think he needs to get a better writer. If he gets a better writer, I think he does a really good job with the way he creates his worlds. He may have a masterpiece on his hand. I'm just saying, just get a better writing partner. Uh, the director of Polaroid, he actually did the new Child's Play, which, uh, again, I've also been wanting to get a video. Wanted to get a video hopefully by the end of November. Wanted in October. Uh, copyright claims. 30 days, yeah, I don't even know, but uh, I'm glad to see the director at least is still getting work after the Weinstein debacle, but also check out Current War. I mentioned it earlier in the video in case you forgot about it. I think it's still playing some places. I thought that was a pretty good movie as well, um, but I'm curious to know your thoughts about any of these movies. Let me know down below in the comment section. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll send you one of these.